electromagnetic fields, one of the most pernicious threats to your health. How do you fix it? Hi, this is Dr. Mercola helping you take control of your health. And today I am joined by Dr. Dietrich Klinghart. Many of you may know who he is, but he happens to be my longtime mentor of the last two decades. And I've learned so much information from him. And I'm especially grateful for helping me personally understand that I was delusionally arrogant about my ability and belief to think that I could somehow be immune to being damaged by EMF exposure. And uh, I lectured with at one of his events uh, in March of 2017, and he just gave his normal lecture and he said it in a way that really impacted me and I finally embraced it and understood it. And it's been my passion now, really the topic of my new book. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And just for the record, the mentoring has gone both ways with us. <laughs> you have been as much a mentor to me as I have been for you. Yeah. Well, the you, the reason you're such an important mentor is you're still in the trenches, and you know I've I've not seen patients for ten years, so there's information that you can only get by treating patients like you do, and you know the hard reality. This is not book learn knowledge. This is in the trenches, which is the hardest to ac accumulate and come by. So thank you for all your hard work because that's that's difficult. And and you and you're just not seeing measuring patients subjectively or subjectively, but you have these tests that you use, these energetic assessments that are very profound, very sophisticated, and are able to really quickly go in and identify what the real mm -hmm. problems of the patients are the, at the foundational level, not superficial mm -hmm. and certainly usually yes. not drugs. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things I respect about you is that you refuse to see new patients and you still do see new patients, but you refuse to see them if they fail to implement a strategy to lower their EMF exposure. So yeah. why don't you start there and tell us how you came to that conclusion and, w and why you made that recommendation? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I should start saying that when I was uh, 16, 17, I had uh, the, the blessing of having a fantastic physics teacher involved in the uh, uh, development of the jet engine. He basically is the inventor of the jet engine. He was never honored for it, but uh, he, he was a fantastic physicist and got my passion for physics uh, going and then when i went to medical school of course i missed physics <laughs> i uh, i felt like you know medicine had gone the wrong way and so uh, since i graduated from medical school my attempt was always to combine biochemistry with good biophysics um you know and so in germany we we were a little bit ahead with that you know the, the like the work with magnetic fields you know the different mats that people buy you know that you sleep on that pulsate magnetic fields the whole uh, rife technology you know royal rife was american but um, there have been uh, the same developments have been in germany since the late 1800s people used pulsed uh, uh, electromagnetic fields for healing purposes and so um in in high school already made aware that uh, the fields created in the home uh, from over high power landlines uh, were dangerous for your health. We were made aware that we shouldn't sleep next to an electric outlet, that we should not have any lights uh, close to our bed or electric alarm clocks. That was already known in the 1960s. You know, so, uh, and so I had that sort of in my back. And then when I came over here for a while, I forgot all of that. <laughs> and then uh, really based on my work with autistic children, um, it, it all came back to life. I was uh, looking at this incredible crisis in autism and I started treating autistic kids in the late 90s and went to the medical meetings, the, the uh, uh, biomedical approaches to to treat autism and uh, it was entirely missing in those conferences was the the aspect of the electromagnetic fields that the child, child is in and so I did a, a pilot study that 
never made it into a medical journal, but where we basically, uh, with autistic kids, we went back to the place where the, the mother was sleeping when she was pregnant with that child. Um, and we found that the average exposure of an autistic child to a non-autistic child was 20-fold higher uh, of the combination of low uh, frequency electromagnetic fields you know, from the household currents and the exposure to microwave from the incoming cell phone radiation was the difference of 20 to 1. That means uh, we had families moved, you know, and so we had to actually go back in the study. We have to go back, knock on the home of a stranger and kind of say, well, sorry, can we go in your bedroom and measure uh, the the fields that are there and we had to reconstruct that actually bring the router that used to be there in the house uh, to the old home so it was very complicated to do that because it was retrospective but the numbers stand and for me that was uh, con confirming for me what just had taught me uh, Wolfgang Mess, you know he's the the uh, man who originated building biology you know the whole thing that the gigahertz solutions a company comes out of that there's a whole development oh, I, didn't, in Germany. I didn't know i didn't know they came out of uh, building biology came out of that or the gigahertz came out of building biology did not know that makes oh, absolutely sense, yeah 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 no the the man who um uh, who created gigahertz solution himself is neurologically very injured from from exposure to electromagnetic fields and that's how we started a company but he is working under the umbrella of the uh, building biology and that's Wolfgang Mess. he is an architect physicist uh, genius and himself uh, struggling with his own health problems but he's so the decisive mind behind it and so to make this to, to sum this up so we found out with autism that the the only proven cause ever of autism you know there's different theories you know the glyphosate the the uh, uh, acetaminophen the the Tylenol exposure during the pregnancy um, the the environmental toxins the Lyme disease theory which and there's many theories of what creates autism but the only thing that actually was ever measured in numbers to electromagnetic fields that the child was exposed to in a sleeping location where the mother was when she was pregnant with the child. And a study that I've misplaced in my computer shows <laughs> that microwave, now we're talking about cell phone radiation, a Wi-Fi mm -hmm. router inside the house. So the, it's the amp that you can measure outside the body of a pregnant mother concentrates 20 fold in the womb where the babe, where the fetus is. So whatever we're measuring, you know, with the instruments on the outside of the womb is 20 times higher on the inside of the womb that's that's published. And so unfortunately, the, the membranes around the womb have that strange effect in concentrating the ambient electromagnetic field that the mother is in uh, significantly and reaching levels that are not sustainable uh, for uh, human development. And what I really want to say is that I have two kinds of autistic families or families with autistic kids, the ones that are dramatically improving and the one that are improving. And the difference is the parents that understand the importance of minimizing the exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields and that in protective measures that we will talk about you know but that was for me like a huge breakthrough in my own work seeing this to be real that what a huge difference that makes that we can have generations of brilliant healthy children if we do not expose them to this if we protect them from this and so in China, uh, women have to wear, by government order, protective uh, clothing over the pregnant womb. You know, so when uh, we hear stories that women, uh, pregnant women, are stopped in the street in Beijing by the police, and they're checked if they're wearing their protective clothing to protect the womb, 
and uh, we know <laughs> we're very far away from that over here. Um, wow! And so, so that that and you so, know for a fact that's going on, and and this protective clothing is like silver uh, coated threads that essentially form a absolutely. Faraday cage. That, um, Wow! I'm, I did not know uh, that. protective clothing that we use here, but it's enforced there by law. We also hear that the strictest rules in terms of the amplitude of cell phone radiation that people are exposed to, the strictest rules are in Russia and in Iran. And we heard uh, my brother sent this to me, and I have a, a Russian colleague working with me, um, a lecture that Putin gave to his assembly and basically saying we do not need to go to war uh, with America. America is committing collective suicide <laughs> by the way they're using electricity. And we just have to wait until they're all in the psychiatric hospital. You know, and that was Putin pretty much verbatim translated. And he wants to, you know, Russia to be Russia again, to be a strong nation again. And so he is doing it differently. He's doing it by limiting the electromagnetic exposures and knows that it's going to create a whole different crop of children that are going to grow up to be intelligent, to be leaders in the world, to be scientists. And um, we, are, we are a dying nation, basically, because of the way we're fluoridating the water, the way we um, have adapted the vaccine program, the, the electrosmog. We, we created a perfect storm um, to dumb down a whole nation. And, you know, I'm different from you i'm here by choice i i came to america because i love this country and i see it going downhill so quickly and in spite of the two of us working against it <laughs> well we're making progress in some ways but but the mm. title of my new book the tentative title i think the one that's going to make it to the publication is the emf extinction so that echoes your concerns and the reason that uh, i justify that is that as you mentioned we've got autism on the beginning stages. We've got Alzheimer's on the end stages. And we're looking at 50% of the population having each one of those. And in the middle, you have fertility imp impact. It's already down 50% in male fertility. So if you can't reproduce, 50% of the people born are autistic and 50% are demented. How can a species continue to exist? It can't. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, let me... Yeah, let me say two things to this because you just hit two points that are really important. One is the fertility issue. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that to you in our March meeting. <clears throat> there's a British scientist, Barry Trower, who was the leading oh, sure. scientist of for the M MI6. You know, and he mm -hmm. he was the one who had the job to explore what can be done with microwave in terms of affecting people's health. And uh, right now we have the crisis in Cuba, you know, where mm -hmm. uh, Cuban embassy members got very ill and they're suspecting a microwave weapon was used against them. We don't know the truth of that. I think they just got leptospirosis, you know, this uh, common illness in Cuba that people get, but we find out what happens with that. But uh, Barry Tro uh, had to experiment on orphanages free, you know, an orphan is free for like a monkey to study on. So they explored on orphanages what they can do to make uh, to make them crazy, to make them sleep with different microwave frequencies. And the part was how to make them infertile. And so, and then they took that research to the psychiatric hospitals in England and tried to find out how they could sterilize whole psychiatric populations in order to not do what Hitler did uh, to psychiatrically ill patients in concentration camps and kill them. Uh, and so the English had a noble, more noble way of doing that by using microwave. And the frequency that they found that sterilizes people is 2.4 gigahertz. It's the same carrier frequency is now used in all the Western countries to drive the, the cell phone systems. And uh, of course, now we go to 5G, we don't know really what that will do. There's some research behind it that's going to be even more sinister. So that, that was that part, just to, to comment on the fertility issue. And so it's known now, it's estimated that over two or three generations of exposure, ongoing exposure to the same cell phone radiation that we're using now uh, we will all be sterile and we will basically dying out as a species. We're going to become extinct. 
as you suggest. The other thing that I wanted to, to say with this that's really important is this beautiful, beautiful researcher from the Karolinska Institute, Ole Johansen, the key editor of the Journal of Pathophysiology, did a study in Sweden in 2005 where they basically looked at uh, different villages and parts in Sweden that had either high levels of cell phone radiation in the average home or very low levels. And he basically, and then did a map of that of Sweden and the map of where the highest density of Alzheimer's disease is and found an absolute direct correlation where there was the highest exposure cell phone radiation was the highest incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And before we go on to the next question, a uh, right now is that the uh, half of the population that is alive right now will either die with Alzheimer's disease. And Ola Johansson predicted that in 2006, the study came out that he said, if we don't change the course in 10 years, we will have an epitome of brain-related disorders, which we have. So his predictions have come clear and through. And he is under tremendous pressure now from his own alma mater, from his own university. That's where the Nobel Prize comes from, to resign. The cell phone industry has threatened to withdraw much of the funding to the Karolinska Institute if he stays. And so, mm -hmm. but because legally they cannot get rid of him <laughs> because he's a tenured professor in Sweden, that's for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, but they put tremendous pressure on him to resign. Uh, and so that's something you indicated before. The cell phone industry financially is now estimated five to six times stronger than the industry. And so there's no politician that can uh, make their financial plans without sponsors from the cell phone industry into the equation and that sort of has meant that there is no uh, that the that the science is not translated into public policy yeah yeah it's the same strategy that the drug companies use and as you mentioned there's six the telecommunications has six times more funding and they six more times more control of the federal regulatory agencies yeah. so their strategy is identical they discredit the people who bring up the truth they defund them and then they spin off not one not two but usually 10 to 20 other studies that they fund themselves that come up with uh, this the, the other opposite conclusion that supports their position and they say look at we do we do all these meta-analysis and you know the weight of the evidence shows that these guys were wrong it's classic classic yeah. tobacco science and in fact they hire the same pr firms as the tobacco industry does but i want to let's I say one Go ahead. Well, just one more quick thing to that, you know, so the World Health Organization a couple of years ago, you know, they took all the studies, even though all the junk studies or so, and still concluded um, that the exposure to cell phone radiation is a potent carcinogen uh, and put it in the same class as tobacco. And so for me, it's always like kind of funny, you go into Starbucks and it says free Wi-Fi, but no smoking. Or you go into a school, <laughs> there's no smoking, it's not allowed. In fact, you get hung on the next tree if you found smoking in a school. But everywhere there's Wi-Fi um, in restaurants. And now we have a movement in Europe now, instead of saying free Wi-Fi, uh, we have hotels now that say Wi-Fi free. <laughs> <laughs> well that's okay as long as you provide yeah. a wired connection which i'm happy to do i i i crave a wired connection uh, absolutely yeah yeah so it's a big issue so what what i want i want to don't want to start ranting and raving and things but i want to focus on pop practical solutions that people can have and one that i didn't fully appreciate and you mentioned earlier especially with the ELF exposure to women who are pregnant at night when they were sleeping. So I don't see patients, haven't seen them for 10 years. I mean, I see a few patients, but that's friends or, you know, some celebrity or something. But normally it's, I don't see patients. So you've got, you're in the trenches, you've got the feedback. So it seems from everything I've read that the most potent strategy that you can use is to not have any exposure to 
electrical fields, that's ELF, extremely low frequencies, about 50 to 60 hertz, depending on where you live, in the bedroom at night. And the only way you can do that, well, there's two ways you can do that. One is to turn off the circuit breaker in your bedroom, unless you live in Chicago or New York, because the building codes there, the greedy unions that said, we've got to put all the electrical wires in conduit, which, you know, so they make more money, but did they know that that remediates the EMF unless you plug in an outlet. So if you live in New York or Chicago, I do it's unplugged. You don't have to turn off your electricity. But the good thing to know that too, that the com that commercial code exists in most hotels so that when you're in a hotel, all you have to do is plug out, unplug every single cord that's plugged into the wall and you essentially do the same thing as turning off the circuit breaker. So... Can you, so, so that's my understanding, but I'm not in the field like you, you are. So can you give us a clinical perspective on that observation? Yeah. So, uh, of course, I, I look now through the lens of my patients that are recovering and the ones that don't. You know, so first of all, I want to say the obstacle in getting this information out is the undereducated American male person. You know, we have a lot of people. Here. <laughs> we have a lot of patients, you know, from Indian origin or from Russian origin or from other countries. The men are extremely quick in getting the idea that this is a big issue and we need to deal with it. Um, the American male has been the main obstacle in this, you know, and on average, you know, they had like maybe five hours of physics in school opinions. But uh, I differentiate between daytime technologies and nighttime technologies. The, the most important uh, time for us, for brain health, and let's just put that under that umbrella, the most important time for brain health is the sleeping time. It's in deep sleep that the lymphatic system in the brain works. Um, where acetylcholine builds up in the brain that's a memory and higher thinking neurotransmitter. And this depends on a very delicate balance of the chemistry in the brain and the electromagnetic fields that the brain is in. And so what we are uh, very, very strong on at night, uh, we do want the house shut off and this is not just in the bedroom the circuitry in the bedroom but for all the house maybe with the exception of the refrigerator or if you live in tucson or so uh, the you, you probably have to keep your air conditioning on which then i would even insist on a separate wiring that uh, that doesn't follow the normal circuitry. Electric fields are very funny. You can switch off the, the electric field in your bedroom and have it on like two rooms and through induction, the, <clears throat> the, through induction, the field can still jump from one circuitry to the next one. It can still be in a really bad field. Um, you know, we, we're talking about body voltage, you know, that's sort of what builds up in your in your system when you're in a field of uh, the low frequency, the 60 hertz field from the household current. And so at nighttime, we want the fuses off, except for your aquarium and your whatever your or whatever people may need in, in serious health conditions. But there is very, very few excuses to not buy a $4 flashlight and do everything you need to do at night well, with you a can flashlight. Use, you can use cell phone. You already have it. Your cell phone well, has a mic, you know. So that's a battery know, operator. But we want the, we want the cell phone as far away from people as we well, can get if, those. If, so. it, if it's in airplane mode, it's pretty pretty minimal. I've measured it. You know, as long as it's in airplane yeah. mode, you're okay. Which no, no I know, but it, yeah. <laughs> but the, there is that danger of forgetting to <laughs> turn it on yeah, cell yeah, phone. Yeah. It's an extra. It's an extra thing. So I like people to actually put their cell phone in a. A pot in the kitchen, you know, with the pot side upside down, so it's under a Faraday cage. Um, we do have some evidence that your phone can still be found by the uh, Secret Service if it's on airplane mode. You can oh, still yeah. be. I put mine. I put mine in a Faraday bag. You can get them on Amazon for like twenty bucks. And yeah, it, and that's what it. I recommend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I recommend to do that when you don't need it. So. But 
in, in principle, we want the fuses off at night. And if it's possible, you mentioned it before, to spend a few hundred bucks and get a remote switch installed properly um, that from bed you can click a button and it switches off the fuses at the fuse box. Number one. Number two, so for the, for the nighttime, the, the trouble in the US with the poorer population is that you're in an apartment building and you have people below, next to you, above you. And so my first line of advice is move. <laughs> possible. If it's not possible, you can create a protective wall against the neighbor simply by using aluminum foil, the sparkly, more shiny side towards the neighbor. And uh, it needs to be the entire wall needs to be covered. You can also do that with the floor towards the person below you. Foil needs to be earthed. You know, so it needs to be there needs to be an alligator clip on it and needs to be conducted into the wall outlet into the earth and and that works for that works for ELF and microwaves it works beautiful for the microwave for the for the cell phone router that the neighbor has sure. uh, underneath you above you next to you um, by by earthing it uh, so for the cell phone radiation, you don't need the earthing, but the earthing right. is there for the low frequency field. So okay. the thing doesn't uh, low frequency emitting device. And so this works well. It's a practical solution we often have to do because it costs like at best a roll of two rolls of aluminum foil and a cable from Radio Shack. So people can do that for less than 20 bucks um, to protect themselves from the neighbor. By the way, I like to say here that the the Wi-Fi router is such a nice that they're so nice looking piece of equipment, but it is a cell phone tower you're installing inside your home. Mm -hmm. That has very much the same properties as any cell phone tower. And so most people get the idea that cell phone towers are bad, but actually putting it into your your kitchen uh, it's really, really a bad idea. Well, so can I just comment here because you know mm -hmm. the the my observation is that most people are concerned about all like their neighbors Wi-Fi and their cell phone towers, and they don't think that that when the reality is almost all of the Wi-Fi, all of that radiation is coming from inside the home, that they have total control over. And uh, it's important to remember from physics that the intensity, the volume of what you're exposed to decreases with the square of the distance. Yeah? So there is a significant uh, drop. Uh, and, and we have to probably say this, the cell phone uh, itself is the most sensitive measurement instrument that we have. And even if the exposure are absolute tiny, it will still give you the three or four bars so that um, the actual fact that you have cell phone reception does not reflect the danger uh, zone that you're in. It's the physical closeness to the emitting device, and that's most often it's in your own home. In your own home, you have a cell phone tower in your home if you have a Wi-Fi router. And I, I would like to say the old Wi-Fi routers you could turn off from the computer. I've now uh, checked a lot of Wi-Fi routers in home. We can no longer do that. You know, so that was on purpose deleted and by many of the manufacturers that you can no longer switch this thing off. And so we put the Wi-Fi router, if you need to have a router to get the mm -hmm. translate whatever comes in into usable um, internet use. Um, I have a friend here who sews bags, you know, with a Swiss shield cloth. And so we simply stick the Wi-Fi router in this bag and then it no longer is emitting anything, you know. So that's called Swiss Shield, and that the uh, the website for for purposes littletreegroup.com. She mm -hmm. sews these little bags, and you stuff the Wi-Fi router in there, and dramatically drops the the radiation that, that comes off it. Yeah. So I think it, it's it's really important for people to know if it's a cumulative exposure of the low frequency uh, fields that you have from the ambient household currents from the, the circuitries in the home and the incoming cell phone radiation and very often there's also radar from the near airport or what's worse is the tetra, you know, that's the low frequency, the 400,000 hertz uh, range that the police and uh, fire 
uh, departments are using that is devastating that uh, that wavelength and very very hard to shield if somebody uh, lives close to a police station and has gotten health problems I do recommend to move um, these things are very very hard to shield with any known uh, technology but in general for most people it's their own household current their own Wi-Fi router and it's a refusal we have many teenage kids they say I'd much rather let my mother die of breast cancer than switching off the Wi-Fi router at night yeah that, that's Only just so in America. sad yeah uh, you know, that's I'm so teaching sad. many other yeah yeah and it's uh, that's the unwillingness to yield to the to the actual science and the same teenager will refuse look at the science you know somebody say listen we have published papers here that can show you um that the incidence of breast cancer goes up brain cancer whatever you name and so we can show you all this but they won't be interested you know they say no i'd rather let my mom die uh of her breast cancer than uh, not have access to the wi-fi at night it's a true addiction you know we know that the the uh, screen addiction is one part of it but the addiction to the actually have the system vibrated at uh, sure. 2.4 gigahertz. Well, I, I, I want I want to discuss how it impacts some of the diseases like cancer. But before I do, yeah. mm -hmm. just, just finish off on the topic of the radiation in your home. As I was doing my remediation, I was really surprised because I still had this belief that it was all coming from the outside. Just the assumption I was my neighbor's Wi-Fi, it's the cell phone towers, and I couldn't get my radiation down low enough until I finally occurred to me that my cell phone was on. Oh, I wasn't talking on it, but it was on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. literally 20 to 30 feet from the cell phone being on gave unhealthy radiation. 30 feet away, I'm mean, talking in the next room, it was still yeah. causing a problem. So you got to turn yeah. it in airplane yeah. mode. It's you have, uh, you know, of course, with the technique that I use, the ART, uh, we test everybody on how far, as soon as the cell phone is switched on, how far from the phone uh, is their body going into a stress reaction and mm -hmm. the interesting thing is whether people feel that they're electrosensitive or not uh, they, they have are. the same reaction you know and it's just the people that are electrosensitive they are aware of it the other ones are not aware of this the cancer rates are the same the same uh, rate of neurological diseases uh, same rates of brain fog whether you feel like you're electro hypersensitive or you're not for people to hear so how far, is is it most, how far is it for most people when you test them? How many feet away But when you turn feet. the phone on? About it's 12 how, feet. 12 yeah, feet? That's... Okay. Yeah. So I, I think it may be. Well, the, that becomes, I guess, biologically significant. But the, you can measure the fields like over 20. Easy. Further away, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what I wanted to find out now, because again, you're in the field, you're seeing this, and you see many patients, sick, sick patients, and a lot of people with cancer, which is, of course, pervasive. You know, one in two people almost are having cancer now. So what is your experience, not in really the contributing factors, I think, well, maybe you can comment on the contributing factor of EMFs, but how different is the response of the patients you're treating once they actually apply the EMF restriction? Do you see a significant response difference? Yes, it's pretty much, uh, it's almost black and white. You know, when people come back, I see people only every four months. And so if people come back after four months and there's no improvement, my first question is, well, tell me what you've done to mitigate uh, the <laughs> electromagnetic fields. I'm not asking them, have you done this and this and this else, and what have you done? The, the starting difference is if a patient says they're not better, they haven't done it. And the people that are better, they've done it. And to the degree they've done it, that much improved. It's black and white. And we haven't talked about the daytime strategies. I just wanted to give you that. So sure, when sure. somebody is already ill, um, they have to use the Stetsa filters to decrease the dirty electricity is a big deal. Um, we have to check uh, the ground current, that's the, the magnetic fields created by electricity traveling under the house back to the power station. It's called ground current, that's a big deal, uh, but it shows up as a magnetic field inside the house. Um, we have people how, where- how do, you, how do you test that? You do it with- uh, uh, yeah, just the, the you you want to measure the magnetic field in the sleeping location. 
Okay. So like, like the gigahertz well, solution of NFA 1000 that would do it. Yeah. And ideally, yeah. ideally it should be 0, 0.0 le uh, volts per meter and less than 0.2 milligauss or maybe even less than 0 0.05 milligauss. And, uh, and that is if the sicker the patient is, the more radical the protection needs to be. It's a pretty simple equation. We also have a, a, a test now, what, that before you, go, before you go on, just the dirty electricity. If you, in fact, you are able to turn off the electricity to your bedroom or your house if you need to, because you don't, because if you have the a, a really good device, and you may not need to turn it off now, so if you measure it in your bedroom, but 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 assuming you turn it off and there's no electrical fields in there, then dirty electricity is an issue, is it? Because there's nothing to. That's how it gets mediated through the field, right? Yeah, absolutely. But th that's why I call this daytime technology. So meaning. Okay during the daytime when people are depending on having to use the, the fridge and the TV and the mm -hmm. whatever people or uh, work, we need a different set of um, uh, of precautions. And so the, the big one is, the, the very doable one is the Stetzer filters. In Graham Stetzer is a physicist who won many awards for a simple principle of taking the internet of the electric, you know, so you know, there's devices now where you can get the whole internet of the electric outlet because it piggybacks on it. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a room, which, your body... Which, which, which some people try to do to, to use, to stop wireless, Wi-Fi, so, so they can use that as a cheap way to wire their house. That I still think is a better idea. Okay. <laughs> you know, but, but just to explain what dirty electricity is, you know, through induction, I'm not going to explain the induction, but through induction, um, you can piggyback every frequency on the electro, uh, electric grid that runs into the house. And one of the things piggybacked on it is the entire internet. So you have billions of phone calls on in your electric fields in a home. And if you're in the middle of a room and uh, the field is 60 hertz, but on top of superimposed on that wavelength are millions or billions of different frequencies that your cells are listening to with your ears. You can't see it, but your cells are vibrated at that level. And it has biological effects that can be absolutely catastrophic. And so the Stetzer filters are reasonably inexpensive. It's a couple of hundred bucks. Um, well, for the whole house, maybe $2,000, where you can uh, hugely diminish that part. So that's a daytime technology that people can also take to work. We know that the light bulbs, uh, uh, fluorescent, the energy saving ones that we use, the CFLs, compact fluorescent lights, um, they're emitting microwave. It's like having every light bulb is like a small cell phone tower emitting uh, those frequencies, which is absolutely devastating to the health of people. So workplace or home, those need to go and they need to be replaced. We're still of the old light bulbs that were safe, they cost more electricity, but the cost in health that people have by by getting the uh, the CFLs in there, um, the cost of health is a million times more than what you save in electricity. And so it's a stupid, absolutely stupid development. You know, they're, they're mercury vapor based, and there's a whole issue with that, but you have the mercury frequency piggyback on the light that you're sitting under uh, creating huge health problems for people. But anyway, so they actually increase those your body are, voltage too. They actually transfer electrical voltage into your body. Yeah, so through it's, the air, it's through the air. Dramatic worsening of the human condition, and then you know the LED lights that will def definitely be the future. They are safer. They're not perfect yet. Um, they are safer, but the old light bulbs were fantastic. <laughs> and so you know what they you know what they have they have. Uh, near, mid, and far infrared. Most of the energy is not visible light. It's actually infrared, which is why and it's health. Infrared is healthy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but we're waiting for your book to have all those details in there. <laughs> so, so in terms of daytime uh, strategies, and then the Wi-Fi router. Wi-Fi router has to be bagged in a bag that it no longer can emit, and you have to go on broadband, Ethernet, whatever internet if you have teenagers in the house 
house, you need to provide for them a cable connection. Um, pad, you know, an iPad has been the most horrible um, intrusive device in the world because you can only use it on the in, on the wireless internet. So if well, you have an it, iPad, and it is technologically possible to use an iPad with a wired connection, but you have to have an Apple. Uh, two Apple adapters, and one of them has to be a USB-powered USB connector. So you can do it, but it's really hard, and you have to be plugged into the wall to do it. Oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, Te no, technically thanks possible. That, you know. Yeah, but not, yeah. not practical, not pragmatic. I have an old iPad, and don't, I don't remember that it has any access point to put anything else in there. But no, it's I'm a charging cable. Wrong. It's a charging cable. You, oh, there's I adapters see. for it, and then you get an adapter for that to go to a USB connector. But the USB connector oh, yeah. has to be powered, otherwise it won't work. Oh, yeah, it's thank very, you. I think very, that's a big one. very, very cumbersome and not practical. <laughs> okay, let's go back over the daytime technology. So, Stetzer filters, the light bulbs are an important issue. In terms of the computer has to be on airplane mode. People forget that. And then the use of the cell phone. Well, sort of things. Uh, so, yes, you should text as much as possible. You should, uh, if you, well, you should keep it short. There's a well, the blue tube system, uh, where basically where the loudspeaker is far away from your brain, and then there is just hollow plastic tubes that guide the sound into your ears. Uh, the other headphones are a disaster. They're conducting the field right into your brain, uh, and so you know. So there's only one system that we know. It's called the blue tube system. Um, of, of headphones, uh, but in general, if people should, should go back and insist on having landlines in their homes and at work and use that as much as possible and only use a cell phone really as an emergency device. Mm -hmm. That's um, what they should be. Or as or, a texting. Yeah, or as a mini computer that in the airplane mode. <laughs> That's the only as time it's portable mini As a portable mini computer. So, um, the other, the last bit of the daytime strategies is the protective clothing. You know, I know there is lessemf.com is a good website that has all of that, including the full burqa. And uh, I was amazed last time I took a train ride in Germany. Like I said, they're a little bit ahead with that. And on all the trains in Germany, I was Wi-Fi. And it's virtually in every wagon of the, there were like 20 of them. There was at least one person sitting there with a full Wi-Fi protective, full burqa. It slits open on the rest, this protective cloth draped over them. And I was amazed. And nobody, <laughs> there's these people walking around in a full burqa. Um, you know, nobody smiled at them. Nobody made any derogative remarks or jokes or so. So we're still far away from that. I tried that here once on the airplane and I was asked by the stewardess to give up my dress code, um, otherwise I have to leave the plane. You know, so we're far away from that, but it's devastating for me now that all the inland flights in the US uh, priding themselves of having Wi-Fi for the whole flight. And for me, it's a, that's a disaster for our brains. You know, so, I've, I've actually measured that on the, on the plane. It's not, the, the, the levels aren't too high unless you access it with your device. So if you, the moment you log on to Wi-Fi on the plane, it goes up mm -hmm. like 10 to 100 times as opposed to just being exposed. Yeah, to well, the interesting thing with the plane is it's a Faraday cage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it doesn't need a lot of radiation in there to, for everybody to have reception. But I, I feel it, you know, when, uh, when I fly to England, which I do every every month, um, I fly on board British Air. Beautiful. I can sleep. I arrive rested. But when I fly from Seattle to New York, which is only five hours instead of nine hours, I'm covered from it because of the, the Wi-Fi. Okay, but um, the, the clothing, um, there is very attractive t-shirts, there's underwear, that's the minimum I require of my patients with neurological disease and uh, autistic kids need to wear that 24-7 and that has made a well, huge would, would, difference. Don't they need something for their head? The, I mean, don't you want to protect their brain? Well, um, I think it's a short-sighted assumption that the, the radiation that goes in the brain will have its main effect on the brain 
the 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 larger the body surface is that's exposed to Wi-Fi and gets and and so by protecting your larger part of the body with the t-shirt um, you get more benefits for your brain than when for example you wear a cap on your brain your brain it's the yeah it's the body surface that's exposed that's what is the sick making thing not whether it's the brain or the chest or the bum that's exposed or the legs yeah and we brought up another point in a previous interview we did recently on the spore biotics is that yeah we know it affects humans we know it affects plants and animals and insects but it also affects our gut microbiome. So if you're covering the belly, then you're limiting exposure of your gut microbiome to these pernicious EMF uh, wavelengths. Marco Rogero published that, uh, and I, I, you know, completely overlooked that until about two years ago. And we looked at the science. You know, when you take the entire DNA that's in our body, human DNA is only two percent of that. But DNA is only microbial DNA and most of the microbes are far more sensitive and damaged by the microwave and and I would say this and I think it's an important truth there is no such thing as a pathogen there is microbes that can behave in symbiotic ways and pathogenic ways and what determines that is how well our system accepts them and communicates with them and how the existing microbes in us communicate with new bugs to come in. And we know that the microwave exposure has created the greatest confusion in that part of our system, that the microbes no longer know who they are, who's friend, who's foe. There's a huge level of confusion going on. Uh, and the, the microbes in us feel constantly attacked by the microwave exposure. And when a microbe is attacked, it moves from being a symbiotic bug to become a pathogen. And so, and since we're only 2% of the equation, imagine having 98% of us being our own enemy. We're creating, it's, it's a, I know the truth of this. I, I can't prove it ultimately yet, but it will emerge in the next few years as, as a very, very um, uh, cruel thing that when we, looking at the exposure to toxins we, we went through this with glyphosate you know that we realized that glyphosate is far more damaging to our microbiome than to our own body but that damage to the microbiome health <laughs> that's just how we discovered how important the microbes are for our health that we are not separate from the microbes that live in us and now after glyphosate now it's electromagnetic field that have emerged as the main factor that turns symbiotic microbes into aggressive pathogens that are working against us because they're feeling attacked and they're kind of saying, okay, I'm going to shoot back. So they're turning up the production of biotoxins that were silent before. I think it's important that people hear that this is not just about us, the whole EMF thing, it's also about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a it's a brilliant observation, and that's not obviously uh, apparent and escaped you until just recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, going back to patients, um, we know count, count statistics shows that the most devastating neurological disease, ALS, is now on par in numbers with MS. MS, you know, mm -hmm. considered now like a reasonably curable chronic neurological disease that we said, okay, we used to have 20 years to deal with it and fix it. And we took the amalgams out and uh, there's a whole new ball game. Uh, most ALS patients die within two years of the diagnosis and I'm having my fair share of them. And we found amazing benefits for the first time. The first treatment that actually works for ALS is the radical EMF protection. And the same principle has applied to our autistic children that the most intervention is the radical EMF protection. It's not the biomedical approach, not giving them luteolin and, and whatever vitamin C and melatonin, but it is the protection from electromagnetic fields. Um, 
we know in in Parkinson's now Parkinson's now so there is a particular kind of microbe in the gut that seems to be responsible either if it's missing or if it's there you get Parkinson's but we we've known from other studies you know the the exposure to organophosphates uh, pesticides herbicides plays a huge role we know there is, there is a link to mercury toxicity and manganese and all that and says none of that unless you put the patient in an electromagnetic field a man-made electromagnetic field then all hell on the on the patient who will have an inclination of that and it is dramatic when you see the benefits uh, the people have that most people misunderstand me you know so yes yes I'm doing all of it Dr. Klinger and then what we find out okay instead of uh, being three hours on the cell phone every day then now 30 minutes on the cell phone do the rest with texting but that's all they heard of our instructions and so patients that we have needs to be on average our statistics instructed four times they need to hear the same talk before they get it or they get out you know when they say okay I can't do that you know when I then get to say well sorry you cannot be my patient because it is so much work for me to treat you um, treat electromagnetic influences in the system with intravenous vitamin C or glutathione I'm sorry, you know, I can ameliorate the uh, oxidative damage that it's causing with all sorts of biochemical interventions, but it's not honest for me and not fulfilling as a physician that we to have these exposures. Um, you come here to my office complaining that you're only slowly getting better. Um, so, you know, that's sort of what I thrive on. Yeah, well, I think I think we need to hear that, and and not just patients. I think it's the physicians, even the integrative medical physicians. And was, was really when you spoke in March, and I heard that, I said, "Gosh, I'm one of those those people that not applying this." And most any physician, there's just a handful of physicians who understand this, and you're one of them. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned Marty Paul. You know, Marty Paul is an old friend of mine oh I did not um, know that yeah you know, <laughs> you know, yeah no no we've we've been in a think tank together uh, oh, uh, was, great. I love that man he's, he's brilliant and uh, one pearl I gained from him you know, so he he talks about the abnormal influx of calcium ions into the cell really when all hell breaks loose when that happens calcium channel blockers are in that you know so that it can diminish that you know the most well-known calcium channel blocker is magnesium you and your website that turned me on to the idea of magnesium threonate uh, as a, a special type of magnesium and um, I learned from Judy Mikovits she's one of my main mentors and genetic researchers um, uh, she she dove deeply into the contribution of retroviruses to chronic illness especially in all the chronic illnesses like uh, ALS, MS, uh, autism, Parkinson, cancer we find when we with our testing system when we stripping all the other things away the toxic metals, the glyphosate, the, um, the Lyme disease, the viral infections and what we end up with is a plethora of uh, retroviruses and Judy Mikovits found that magnesium threonate is a fantastic antiretroviral agent and so <laughs> so <laughs> one of the things we use for electrosmoke now too as a calcium channel blocker we use mag your magnesium threonate <laughs> wow. and what, what, like, do what, what doses are you using still exploring we I like people to actually go all the way until they get slight diarrhea and yeah, then back I, off I, from that you know to titrate it to to bowel tolerance yeah. and uh, we always combine it with uh, uh, calcium phosphoricum homeopathic that helps to modulate the channels you know we use a, a 12x of calcium phosphate in general we, we test different potencies mm -hmm. but in general it's the 12x that regulates the calcium channel so 
thanks to Marty, I mean, I want to use that here. Mm -hmm. You know, Marty is brilliant and he used his brilliance in many ways. He was the first one who came up with the ALS treatment, you know, with this no ono cycle uh, supplements that he published uh, many years ago. And, uh, and he made a huge contribution now with, uh, with his work on the electromagnetic uh, phenomena. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Joe, uh, I'd like to say something here before we forget it. So, mm -hmm. uh, a number of special interests that push for devices that help you to protect yourself from electromagnetic fields. And I want to give a study example here that will clarify my strong, uh, it's more than opinion, it's a knowledge. So, an experiment, two chicken coops, both had the same kind of lighting, you know, they have like basically 24 seven lights, so they lay eggs all the time and they're heated, so they're comfortable and there's a lot of electric systems in the, in the chicken coops. And so, one of them that cleaned up the electricity by putting devices that are sold on the market to clean up the electricity. This is not the Stetzer filters. These are sort of like ground up crystals and, and things in it, you know, frequencies and uh, different. So they cleaned up the electricity. And the the first, fantastic, you know, the, the chicken with the cleaned up electricity, they looked happier, they were running around. They laid twice as many eggs as the other group. The other group, chicken cowered in the corner away from the electric outlets and electric instruments that were in there and looked really unhappy. Now, they ran the study for five years and what came out is that the chicken in the group with the cleaned up electricity lived only half the lifespan <laughs> as the other group. What I want to communicate here very clearly, if people use devices to make them feel good, while they're in a devastating illness producing field, um, you will get higher cancer rates, you will die earlier than your friends that do not these, have these devices and feel the discomfort. They, they have the insomnia at night when the Wi-Fi router is on until they switch it off. And so, A, your body's response to the field, keep the response but protect yourself that we discussed from it and this includes the things people hang around their neck it includes the things the stickers you put on your phone it, you can make much longer phone calls with the stickers on the phone and feel good you don't get a headache but you will get the brain cancer from it on it now longer than before and so i'm just warning for that, none of the companies had made the due diligence and long-term studies on the safeties of their things. These things are selling wildly. Everybody is promoting them because there's a lot of money to be made and it creates an illusion of safety. The only safety, when we're dealing with physics, we have to counteract physics with physics. You know, we yeah, cannot counteract got, it. Got, you've got to avoid the fields or go into some shielding. And we're talking real shielding Faraday cages. And, you know, you talked about the Swiss yeah. shield. I've been recently encountered a newer German fabric that's silver coated, 100% silver, 99.997% reduction of, of uh, microwave mm -hmm. radiation. So, yeah, we're looking at develop. We're, they're making a sleeping bag for me, and I'm going to pick it up in Chicago next week so that when I travel, yeah, I'm, cool. I'm protected. So like like the burger you talked about. But, you know, you, essentially you want to, you're right. The answer is avoidance. It's not these devices. Uh, by the way, there's also uh, Trevor Marshall. I, I think you may know him. He's the guy sure. who came up uh, with the, the Marshall Protocol to treat Lyme disease which we, I, I kind of had many disagreements with by using a, a drug, you know, Benicar, that opens the vitamin D receptor and so forth. But he recently published uh, an observational study giving people just a head protective headgear mm -hmm. and uh, monitoring their health and found dramatic improvements in, uh, in the people's health that were wearing it. And I have to say, his headgear that he designed is absolutely beautiful. It looks gorgeous. So, wow. <laughs> so there is. Uh, it was shielding. Point. It was shielding. Yes, it was the shielding cloth. He used the Swiss shield uh, for that. But the beautiful design of it, you, you can Google uh, Trevor Marshall and you find uh, his his statements on that and and what he's published on that. But I'm I'm glad that somebody 
caliber, so also looking at the electrosmog. I think we're all converging on the on the same truth. You well, know, we're not the, all converging. The, the, you, you are the leader. You have, in my viewpoint, you've been preaching this for a long time, and there's certainly other non-physicians who talk about this, but you're really one of the leaders out there, and I can't thank you enough, and just really very disappointed in myself personally that I didn't fully appreciate this sooner. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm deadly serious. This is this is a really a topic of life and death for most people, and potentially yeah. the extinction yeah. of the species if this is if this is not addressed. I mean, it is a very very serious topic. I was I, my last book was focusing on yeah. cancer, but that's just treating the symptoms. It's not treating the cause. Be, uh, let me say uh, some more summing up words. All the insiders of our group know that the disappearance of the bees is it's the the some synergistic effect between the the pesticides and herbicides they're exposed to and the electrosmog where there's no cell phone radiation no bees are dying that not just the bees are dying but there's a general disappearing of insects of many many precious insects especially the pollinating ones and we know that the insects that hugely benefit is the ticks. And one of the reasons why ticks are now taking over is because they're very insensitive to the frequencies mm. of cell phone radiation that we're using where other insects are not. And the, the devastating thing is the, what controlled the tick population in the past was the birds. Birds eat ticks, but birds cannot live on ticks alone. They need all the other insects. And mm -hmm. so there's been a dramatic disappearance in songbirds and insect eating birds because there's no more insects. You know, we, when we go on a meadow now, you don't see the humming and the, the uh, dense population of insects. You see occasional insects now. There's a dramatic um, reduction of that, but only where there's exposure to microwave. We have a German footage that shows trees, whole forests dying just because the cell phone power tower was put up. The, the cell phone uh, radiation, the way it's used right now, is completely against life and is compounded by the heavy metals that are in us, especially the aluminum that comes from the sky and from the air we breathe. We know that the glyphosate and atrazine and other uh, herbicides, pesticides, wood preservatives, all have a compounding effect of that in our body. And we basically have created a perfect storm that we can still uh, ourselves from by eating organically, by avoiding uh, certain things, certain environments, and especially the, the main thing where we have the most control over is the physics. We can counteract physics with good physics. And thrilled that you are uh, have to come on board so strongly and you know I'm I can't wait, wait for your book to come out um, to I'm gonna have to actually have to have you write the forward I would I really haven't done that in the past but you I mean if you're willing to do that because I, I think that you, you know, I mean you're the person who catalyzed my foot my passion about this so I mean it's just totally appropriate of course, I would be honored to do that. You know. All right. Well, great. <laughs> That's good because uh, that would that yeah. would be really good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, you're. I just can't thank you enough. I mean, for leading the way and really helping not just us and the people who are listening to us, but really leading the way for the field and the species to to sort of have not sort of but provide a practical solution and then having the clinical experience and the feedback to understand that these interventions do make a huge difference yeah. because not, not many people are doing them so they wouldn't know yeah yeah and it, you're quite honestly i mean i'm my own best doubter and i had to treat patients for 20 years to see that this is real and it's devastating uh what we're doing and the constant increase of the fields and fortunately there's others there's mark to have us there's you on board, and there, the, you know. Well, there'll be more. There's so but many the, good people the now coming on board. Part of the problem, and it, it is with me, is that you cannot see this, you cannot feel it. Most people, unless you're a canary, which is three percent of the population, yeah. but you can't yeah. feel it. So unless you measure it, you are clueless as to the intensity of the exposure that you have. 
which which is what turned me around once I started getting the inexpensive meters and I said I'm on board. I bought the professional versions just to just to be really precise yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, by the it, way, I'd like to say something. Yeah. There is now uh, for the uh, phones. There is uh, an app that turns your phone into a measuring device. Oh, really? Ultra, -sens ultra sensitive and very, very accurate um, uh, device. Unfortunately, I don't know the the uh, name of the app, but it's All absolutely right. fantastic. Well, you'll, you'll get it for us. Is, you'll, there's someone on your staff. Well, well, Christ Christine device. will. Will it measure microwaves? No. Is that what it measures? OK. Microwaves. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. It measures uh, across a wide spectrum of frequencies the intensity, and so you can use it also as a dosimeter. You know, where you have the cell phone in your pocket. Now you have to have it kind of on <clears throat> and walk through your day, and at the end of the day, you can tell how much exposure you had. And it's devastating the numbers people come back with. Yes. I've seen that in England, used uh, from some of my friends, and it's absolutely amazing. Does it, but it probably doesn't work if it's in airplane mode, would be my guess. No, no, unfortunately yeah. not. So who's going to want to wear that damn thing if it's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, one of the benefits, Dietrich, you may not, may not realize this, but by keeping your phone in airplane mode all the time, your phone battery at the end of the day will be 95%. <laughs> oh, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you never run out of juice. <laughs>